Uh, welcome to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, today we have uh, Coach uh, Mark Brandemart with us. He's the offensive coordinator at uh, Romeo High School uh, in Michigan. Coach, how you doing? Doing great, Nick. Thank you for having me on. Well, I, I appreciate it, Coach. Coach has uh, been on our channel before. Um, he did a clinic for us. He's, he's helped uh, me and several other staffs out last off offseason uh, with some wing tee stuff. Um, and, and Coach, in a minute, going here, we're going to talk about some um, kind of stuff that uh, he transitioned to post or during COVID work, however you want to label that. Um, before I forget, though, uh, make sure you check out the sponsors and the affiliates in the bio. Um, and also a reminder, as you listen to this, if there's anything you want to specifically go back through, make sure you check the tags so you can hear. I mean, in case you missed something or want to go back to the start of a conversation me and Coach are having, please make sure you check that out as well. Um, but I mean, coach, um, before we get started, uh, do you want to kind of explain how you ended up at Romeo? Sure. Um, my career started in, um, Armada, which is the, the neighboring town. That's where I went to high school. That's where I played. That's where I coached. Um, and I coached all the way from, uh, seventh grade, you know, making my way all the way up to varsity, um, and then becoming a varsity head coach. And I was a head coach for two years before I um, made my way to Romeo. And Romeo is the neighboring town, but it's a much bigger district. So they play in uh, the, the, the largest division, Division One, and I was in a Division Four school at uh, Armada. And so, um, so in 2014 was my first year at Romeo, and uh, I came on as an assistant there, um, and then worked my way up through and. Um, and now I'm the offensive coordinator um, after Jason Couch, who was the uh, co-head coach at the time he left in, in 2017. After the 2017 season, he left to go to Alma College, which was his alma mater to be the head coach. So then I kind of stepped in and, and took over the offensive coordinator role um, after he left. And uh, I've been there ever since. And so, yeah, it's it's been a great experience uh, coaching in Romeo and uh, – great community to, to work with now y'all have um been predominantly wing t over over the course of that time and y'all have made some changes since then but before we go into kind of your changes and your adaptations why did you guys initially become a wing t team or why was it so successful for what you guys were doing so my my first year there in 2014 um we, we made it to the playoffs and we were predominantly a spread team, and they had been a spread team probably for the 10 years prior to that. And we, we got into a uh, first week of the playoffs. It was actually Halloween night up in Lapeer, uh, Michigan, which is a little bit north uh, west of, of Romeo. And it was sleet and wind and just uh, terrible weather. And we got into this battle with, with a, a team that, that we felt that we – we had better athletes than them and we felt that we could compete and, and the team was we were peaking at the right time in the season defensively but when we got up against them and they were a power run team uh they were kind of like a power spread uh team but you know they they controlled the clock they played good defense and um we ended up losing a, a very close game to them and it's, you know first round of the playoffs kind of dejected after that season the coaches started to meet and um, the current head coach, Kurt Reines, uh, was talking with Jason saying, hey, we got to make a change so that we can get past this point where we can win in the playoffs. And, and, and to that point, they hadn't won um, a, a district championship um, since, since the 93 season. So they've been making the playoffs and been successful, but not, not making it deep into the playoffs. So, so we kind of went to the drawing boards. And my, all my knowledge... Uh, for the most part, was coming from running the power tee, from running the double wing, like uh, you had mentioned earlier that you guys do, and uh, just wing tee schemes in general. So I kind of brought in that knowledge, and we did some research, Jason Couch and I, and as we put things together, we kind of started to use a um, kind of a hybrid wing tee system uh, in which we were going to go under center and have a, a, a double wing, under center wing tee version, your classic red and blue formation and a lot of jet series is what we were going to hang our hat on, but then have the ability um, and, and 
and the and we had the athletes to do it to step back into the gun and use some of our spread passing game and still be able to to run the ball and do our jets and things out of uh, some of those spread formations or at least um, where we remove a couple um, of the, the backs from the backfield and get them out into space because we, we did have some talented athletes that were coming back most of the skilled players were coming back uh, for, for the 2015 season and so we made those changes and going into uh, we go into the, the, the fall practices we do our our red and white scrimmage which is the first Saturday you know we get out there coming off the field coach couch is looking at me he's like we're done with it. We're not running that. We're not doing any more of the wing T stuff. We're done because, you know, we'd get under there. We'd fumble a snap. We'd, the timing on the trap was bad. The, the downplay was getting eaten up by our defense. And we had a really good defense, so they made us look bad early in the season when we were practicing against ourselves. And so I said, you got to give it time. This is the first time these kids ever doing it. It's going to click. You know, it's going to click. Give it time. And so we, we start to go through the season. And as the season builds, the kids, we, we start to – to include more and more of the under center stuff. Um, and when we got into situations that were like, uh Oh, what do we do? That, that often we were getting into those spread sets and, and we had a, a veteran quarterback. He was getting us out of trouble, you know, on third and long things like that. But as the season went, we started to notice these teams were having trouble defending when we went under center and we started scoring more and more points from all those plays. So by the time we got um, to the state championship game and we, we, we were fortunate we played in a few games that the weather was um you know we played one game that had about nine inches of snow um from the morning until the time the game was done and they were like trying to blow the snow off uh, with leaf blowers and things like that during the game but we made it through those games you know i i feel because we were able to go under center and, and pound the ball a little bit when, when we needed to and it probably by the end of the season we were about 70 percent under center and um 30 percent in the in the gun and so you know so it kind of changed as the season went it, was, it became more under center as the weather changed and as we faced some of these other teams they they really struggled to to line up and to um to stop our our game because we had a quarterback that could hurt them and we had some dynamic backs as well now now you mentioned also there the, the mythical um as I, as I classify it power t there um, that that has a strange hold over the state of Michigan. Like yes. I've never, it's I, I compare it to like the the slot T in Texas. Like that's like something that's very unique to there. And yes, there's other parts of this country that run the power T, but I've never seen a group of coaches so heavily influenced or that played in in, in a particular offense like y'all have. Do you want to talk about that offense and kind of the influence it's had on not just you but a lot of coaches in the area over the course of probably past five, 10 years. Yeah. The, the, the power T or some people call it the, the dead T, whatever different <laughs> uh, names for it. The, my first experience really with it was, um, when I first became a coach, I was coaching seventh grade football. I was hired on at, at our made my first year. Um, the, the, the head coaches at that, at our program here were, were, were running the, the, the power T and they got the system from um, Shillito out in, uh, he had been at Muskegon uh, Orchard View and he'd been at um, East Kentwood and, and then he, now he's at Zeeland. And, and obviously all his stuff came from Birch Sigler from Belding High School. And and, that, and those two coaches are, are kind of some of the grandfathers of that system uh, in Michigan. And so I started to go to some of their clinics and they were kind of like, you know, you got to show your card at the door and, uh, <laughs> and you get kind of indoctrinated in it. And it, and then to me, it was just something completely normal. Like many of the teams that were in our league, um, in this blue, blue water area league that, that our made plays in and a lot of the smaller schools across the state all run it. It's like this, it's like the standard offense, you know? And so to me, it was something that was, was normal, you know, running trap and, and the, the power playoff tackle and the keep and the pass and the counter, all those things were, I understood really well because I was coaching them with, with the, like, the middle school kids and up into the high school um so, so it's uh yeah it, it's it's kind of fascinating because then i as i have friends on twitter and different things like that uh they'll post people will post stuff from power t stuff and i'm like oh yeah it's just you know i've seen that before and i you know there's other coaches all around the state that do it but it, it is quite different that 
that a lot of these other states haven't caught on to it. I do really believe that if you can if you can run it at your school where you'll have the administrative backing of running that type of offense because it is I mean it's it's one formation and there's like no motion and it's pound the rock right if you can do that and your, your administration backs you up I think it gives you all the looks of the the option without having to option to people right it 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 creates those conflicts to a defense in a double tight um, setting and creating a conflict where players have to they have to um, really have have roles defensively to stop you and um, I think you, it's, it's an easy way to do it without having to run the option game and, and I think teams that are that don't have much talent can be very successful running it they, they might not have any you know division one or two athletes and they'll kick, kick the snot out of you and I've seen it happen over and over again um, just because of the you know uh, the angles and how quickly it hits and you have to devise a defense for that. Now in the league that I was playing with in here, there was like uh, out of seven teams, four of them were running it. So when you see it that often, yeah. you know, I, I understand how, how to stop it and, 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 and what you need to do. But then like now that I'm coaching in division one, we'll play a team that gets into that formation and it creates a problem because you don't ever see it. You know, yeah. there's only a few, few teams that in the division one and two level that run it in Michigan. Um, that run it well, and they're super um, competitive. They're they're up in the you know in the regional level and semifinal level every year because of that. But at the lower levels, like divisions three through eight, you know, there's a tremendous amount of them, and um, it, it's tough. To, you gotta you gotta strap on the helmet and get ready to go when you when you play those teams. Okay. And then let, let's kind of move on to kind of what we were going to originally talk about today anyways. And, and you guys have kind of um, morphed and evolved as, as COVID was hitting and stuff anyways. And um, you want, before you get to share anything, do you want to kind of talk about the transition you guys kind of went under uh, from your wing tee to more of a gun oriented system? Yeah. So, um, so in 2019 we were, I would say probably 80%, 85% under center wing T, you know, using a 100, 900 formations and, and the blue, um, red and blue type of look, uh, for most of our stuff that we would have a little bit of a gun package. Uh, as we moved into the 2020 year, coaches started to meet and we, we, we were taking a look at our personnel and that's what I'm going to talk, talk about, um, a bit. And the, the personnel was showing us, Hey, let's try to do some different things uh, that, that we can be successful out of the gun and maybe use some different packages. So we started to start to move that way. And then once the lockdown hit, we kind of got into a transition of, okay, how much are we going to be able to do out of this? And not because we're going to have limited time. We're going to have a limited camp. We're going to have things like that. And our season was on again, off again, things like that. So, um, so a lot of changes had to be made on the fly, but one of the, the real cool things, that it happened during this 2020 season was all teams made the playoffs. You know, this, this is the first in Michigan where everybody was able to make the playoffs and then you, you go from there. And so it allowed us to be experimental uh, this year and try some things with, with the athletes we had. Whereas in another season, um, you know, we would not have made the playoffs. You know, we went two and uh, we went two and four in our regular season and, um, you know, two of those, two of the wins came late, late in the season. And then we kind of went on a, a little run and, um, won three of the next four games in the playoffs, but, you know, normally we wouldn't be able to play around with that stuff and lose. Like we lost our first two games. And so, um, when that happens, you're like, okay, what do we do now type of thing? But it was, it allowed us to be experimental. So what I was kind of mentioning was how we were able to kind of adapt on the fly. And it's something that we needed to do uh, as the course of this season went. Um, so we went over the background a little bit, uh, but I'm the offensive coordinator at Romeo. Uh, and now it'll be the uh, going into the my fourth season of doing that, but I've, I've been there since 2014. Um, I mean, we kind of have ultimate goals and I, I, I love talking X's and O's, but something that we really try to hang our hat on at, at Romeo is being able to, to model, demonstrate and teach 
the following things here, like character, um, and trying to, to, to show the athletes that and demonstrate it ourselves so that they can, they can do it and they can take that into their life. We try to do um, a lot of activities with servant leadership where they're in, in roles where they're serving others. And, and then we kind of model accountability and responsibility, right? When you're part of a team, that's so important. And then our motto is effort and attitude. So everything that we do um, is with the controllable um, things in our life. And that's, we can control our effort, we can control our attitude. And so we bring that to practice. We bring that into the weight room. Those are uh, very important things to our program. But I think this is a, a pretty good picture that shows um, kind of where our ultimate goals are as coaches. And that's just to build young men up with confidence. And this is a picture of uh, our quarterback coach, Mark Shuttler. Um, this is after a playoff game in, in 2019, uh, after a loss in the playoffs. And he's consoling one of our senior players and and just letting them know that hey you know we still love you regardless of the outcome and i think that's so important and, and sometimes gets overlooked in high school sports as we get super competitive uh so what's in your toolbox right you you see that commercial a lot um by capital one you know they say what's in your wallet right and each year we always come back to the to the, the meeting room and we're like okay what's going to be in our toolbox what what athletes do we have returning? What what um, can we do that's going to get the most out of our kids? And how do we have to adapt to do that? And so the 2020 season was one where we were able to experiment with this. And so because everybody was going to make the playoffs, I, I felt there was less pressure in the early games to try some different things. And then and we kind of molded things as the season went and we continued to improve and even in the games that we lost in the, there was a couple games, two games later in the season that we did lose, they were uh, highly competitive games against teams that were, were very good teams in our league. And then after our second game, we were forced to, to change. They kind of forced our hand what we originally were doing. So I will kind of go into that a little bit, but we kind of had a plan in place and, and, and a few personnel groups in place, ready to go, right? Um, when we started camp and after the second game, we, we kind of took a look at our personnel. We had lost our, our starting two wings um, and then like our, our backup wing. And those were three out of our four guys that were returning from the, the previous year. They were all out for the season. Um, so we had, we, we were forced to change and that changed kind of our personnel groups as we went. So the questions that I think are important to ask are, do you have athletes that you need to get on the field? As you, as you write down these kids, and we always do, do a ranking, are there athletes that, that we see that, hey, we got to get this guy on the field somehow offensively. He can, he can make a difference. How can we get him in, involved? And is that in a certain situation that we can use him? Is it short yardage? Is it passing downs? What is it that that, that person can bring, and, and how can we get them involved in it? And so... Then, then the next question is, what can we actually teach, right? You can have all these great ideas. If you want to you know, bring an element of option in, if you want to bring some type of deep passing game or screens, can you teach that? And so then you have to have that discussion with your staff and say, okay, there's, there's the athletes toolbox and, and which athletes we have and what are their skills. There's also the same thing with the coaches. And so sometimes you have to there's a lot of great clinics that I've been watching on your channel and everyone else. And so you, you see all this stuff and it looks, it looks great, but if, if you can't teach it, uh, it doesn't matter. It's what can your coaches teach? What are you going to spend the time on to learn to, to be successful with? So I'm, I'm going to kind of bring up a, another question here, but why would you want to use personnel groups? Well, we feel that this helps use players in spots that they can excel. Okay. And, and I, I'm kind of an old school guy. Like I said, I, I for many years, I ran the, the power T and the double wing offense where I was, I was putting players into my system. I, w I was putting them in there because this is the system. This is the, these are the formations we're going to run. These are the plays we're going to run. I had to just adapt them to my system. I had to conform them to this system. And if they were good, we did well. 
if the player was not good in that role, we, we suffered. And so, you know, I think this image is a good example of that, right? Sometimes we take a player and we try to jam them into a spot that they're not going to be successful at. And you can coach them up. You can do the best you can, but you're only going to get so much out of that player. So how can we put them in a role that will be successful? Maybe there's another kid that rotates with them for certain plays, for certain uh, series, things like that, that can, can benefit your team. And um, so like these numbers here, I think are, are pretty um, consistent, like for probably 2018, 2017, and probably be the same numbers. But for players that we were putting out on the field, you know, we were in a kind of a standard 100 formation, right? A lot of the times in, in 2019, we were using 11 guys. And then when we went double tight, then the tight end came in and the X receiver came out. And that's pretty much what we did. Now, obviously there's other kids used that were backups. A kid plays on defense a little bit. He needs a guy to rotate, but uh, that's pretty much what we were doing. And, and so you get those guys involved and they're into it. And then they, they all have a, a guy that backs them up, but that guy, you know, is likely not going into the game unless something happens, right? So in 2020, as I took a look back through the film, um, we had a lot uh, more success with player buy-in because we had 18 guys that were getting in the game due to us using some personnel groups and packages. And so these kids were able to get in the game and do things that they were successful with, that they um, are good at, you know, that fits their skill set. And it, it kept them involved in, in practice, I feel, because they knew that, hey, I'm, I'm listening for my personnel group to go in the game, and I got to be ready at, at all times. And I have to keep current when, when you're in the practice week as well. You're not just saying, oh, I'm, I'm just the, the number three wing. No, I'm, I might be the number three wing in this personnel group, but I'm the number one slot in this, in this personnel group. So they're constantly involved in practice. And I think that that helped a lot, especially with our season, which was the longest season that we've ever had, right? We started it um, in early August. We played our last game in the first week in, of January. And so to keep players involved that long, we had, we had shutdowns throughout it. To keep players involved that long, they got to be invested somehow. So I think this also helps us expand the formations that we use based off of our skill sets. If you have uh, a few guys that are, are good tight ends, great blockers, you can go with a two tight end set, like we did a little bit in 2019. This year we had we had three tight ends that we like to use. So there were some three tight end sets that we used where he was a, a wing player or a sniffer, uh, H-back type of guy was the third tight end. And so we used that a lot once we had injuries to our wings. So what we can expand our formations in some different ways. And early in the season, it was the opposite of that. We were in some two by two spread formations because of those slot wing players that we had that that ultimately were injured. Um, so then things had to adapt and change. This is a look at um, I, I removed the names off of this, but this was kind of like a little sheet that our coaches would have on the field and we hand out okay. to the players so they know what um, personnel group they're, they're in. And so if you see here this cheetah group and so we give a name and so then the coach will be yelling it out, cheetah, cheetah, cheetah. Those players are running out onto the field. And the cheetah is, is kind of a, a no tight end group, right? And it's two wide receivers and two slots or wings and a running back and quarterback, right, is, is the personnel group that's used. And so we would use um, this one quite a bit throughout the season because we had those, those we had a, a couple good wide receivers and um and some slot players and then once we had some injuries that 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 personnel group got used a little bit less but it was yeah. still it was still a major part um and so then we we once we lost those wings we went to using an h-back or sniffer so you can see these personnel groups that like the wing would come out or one of them might still stay in the game as a slot but the wing would come out and we would have what we called Lion um, or Dane. Where they, where these, the Dane had a tight end instead of one of the X receivers. And so there's there different guys that are now coming into the game uh, that are gonna, gonna help us. And this, this was this H back that we used was a, he was a, probably a number two tight end. 
and he would come into the game often. And there was many formations that we used him in. Um, even early in the season, we were bringing him in because he was such a good blocker uh, at tight end that he was. It was more beneficial to have him in there and block down on a buck play where he's going gap down backer um, than it was to have a wing that you know was a lighter guy that struggled with that same block. So that was a nice thing about about having that type of personnel group. Um, Bulldog was what we started the season in. We our our idea at the beginning of the season was hey we're going to have um, a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end, a wing, and then a slot receiver it was kind of kind of be our base set, our, and that was Bulldog, right? And once um, we we lost a few of those wings, we started to live more in the the Dane and Lion world, and then we also moved to these two personnel groups, Pitbull and Mastiff, which um, Pitbull um, was a double tight formation um and then mastiff was the same thing but then um we would take one of those wings out and um but we still had the h back in okay and shepherd was the same as that but we remove uh we remove one of the receivers and it was a, or the running back and it becomes an empty formation uh and bring another receiver into the game so um so we had some some different personnel groups and I think you know it gets to be like oh can can these kids remember that well I think you know you have a number one and two in each of these groups and then some of these we didn't use as much some of them were a few times a game but about three or four of these were regularly used in in each game um and it, you know in some games we're probably using five of these now coach how many it, it of these kind of were depend on the game plan how, how many of these were just personnel groups or and how many of these were personnel groups and formations when you sent these out? Um, they are, they, they are both, right? Yeah. So, but, but some of them were, yeah, a couple like the, the shepherd and pit bull for those, for example, we were usually just jumping into one or two formations with yeah. those guys. Like we wouldn't ask these to come in and be in a, a two by two spreads set or something like that. But there was just a couple formations that they would, would get into. So it was kind of specific to a few formations, but uh, formations like Bulldog, Cheetah, Lion and Dane had many more formations that they morphed into. Um, but we did not, uh, we did not require like, for example, the Cheetah formation to be able to line up in double tight double wing and, and run um, a power play you know they, those kids were never going to practice that or or do it in the game so we didn't ever have them work on things that they wouldn't do does that explain it yeah that's perfect coach okay so what i want to do is show you a few clips of of our of our counter play and how we kind of personnelled it and kind of how it kind of adapted and morphed over the course of the season. So I'll pull this up here. So this obviously diagram is your classic um, jet motion counter to the weak side. And we got, yeah, at our tackle, we got a gap down backer. We got an on to down call here. Center's going on to away. We're gonna pull and kick. We're cutting off at the backside. Uh, tackle the tight end is is pulling and leading through and I'll show you something that we work on with our tight ends when they pull through or whoever the second puller is uh, a skill that we practice so we'll, we'll work on something with our tight end so that they um, they kind of have a rule that they go through with that uh, so we have motion pullback fills and then the counter coming back through and you could do this with a crisscross handoff as well so that's that's standard um, wing T stuff there and that's what like our kids will come up going ninth grade, JV, they're doing this play. Okay, so we'll take a look at it. And so this is this season, this is our Bulldog personnel, right? Which is a tight end, X receiver, two wings and our fullback. And so this is in our district championship. We got motion. 
we're going to pull and kick. And here's what our our tight end is taught to do. He's not going to be like, we're, you could log this and bounce it around. We don't do that. Uh, we're going to double team this guy out because usually there's going to be a scrape uh, replace here. Okay. So he's going to double team him out of the hole. And then we're just going to try to get vertical off that. So we'll take a look at it from, from this vantage point here. Send the motion. Pull. We, we should be trying to get to his inside shoulder, but this guy does a nice job of squeezing. We're going to double team him out. The camera kind of, kind of loses it here, but when that guy's squeezing, the backer's going out there, so we get this wall, right? And so that's where we want to make it through. So that's our, our standard counter. Now, once we lost all those wings, we weren't living in, in uh, living off of that formation. We would, we would mix that in. We'd pepper it in here and there um, in different situations. But we were living out of, of this type of look more often with our, our second or third tight end in here, our H. And so we would call H counter. So the blocking is all the same. The kids are used to doing this since freshman football. But we move to the gun, and we're going to just hand the ball, and he's going to bend it back on his counter instead of a wing, you know, coming from this spot and coming back through this way and getting, you know, depth in the backfield. Now, we would call it into the play, so this would be called um, counter H. That would let the tackle and end know that they're not involved in the pull. It's counter H, so we got the pull and kick, and the H is the, the lead through. If that wasn't called, if the H wasn't called into it, it's automatic that the tight end is going. Yeah. If there's no tight end, if he's out here, and there's no H call, right, these guys aren't involved, then the tackle pulls through. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll show well, you some of that. Well, why is the, out of curiosity, why is the tight end the base, not the tackle? I, um, I guess it's mainly from our from our wing T uh, standpoint where we find that we'll get too much um, leakage coming through the backside. Okay. So that's why we like pulling that 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 tight end through so we can get a cutoff block with this tackle on the, on the backside. Like in this case here, we can block back to a one. If they have a you know a, a three, four, five. That guy sometimes becomes a tough block for our tight end. So it, it just kind of, it seals it up better on the backside. And, and we found that really personnel wise, our tight ends pulled through and, and moved a lot better than our tackles. And they were able to block at the second level better. So we've, we've had some success with that. If you have a tackle, that's really good. You could make that your base way of doing it. Yeah. And you'll see when we go to some of our spread sets, our tackles are formed are, are, excuse me, are forced to pull. And so they do get through there. Um, I think that the H and the, and the Y's did a much better job, but uh, we did have one tackle this year that was, was really good. So when he got through there, he, he did a really nice job. So now this is our, our Mastiff set. Okay. Two tight ends. It's basically three tight ends because here's that H, okay? And we have one receiver in the game. And now he's off the line, so it's double tight with the H. And we run a lot of power. We just run our power kick out of this with him kicking out. So some defenses will start to slant to your to your H. Um, in this case, right, we're just going to go opposite of, of his alignment and go to our, this is counter H left. We're going to get the pull and kick. He's going to lead through. And it's, it's a really quick hitting downhill play. And you're forcing them to play. You know, when you go double tight like this, you're forcing them to play more gaps. Where's that soft spot that they have? So he wraps it back. Probably could have cut back through this way, but it's still a, a real productive 10-yard run. And that that kid's a freshman that, that's running there, so 
some good things in the future for him. Same play, counter H left, this time out of our unbalanced. So this is what we call jumbo. We bring a tackle over. We got a wide receiver. This is Dane personnel, which is one tight end and the H, a slot and an X, but it's the same exact play. These guys are all doing what they're used to. Just they're blocking counter left. We're going to pull and kick. And then that, that H is going to lead through. You can see how they're already, they're geared up to stop power to this side. Cause we run a lot of, we were running a lot of power kick. We get a tremendous double team here on a, on a crabbing player right there. Get our feet out of the way. The H gets lost in, in the, in the mess, but we got a receiver doing a great job blocking and, and the guard with him too. So that was a nice play down in the goal line. So this is an unbalanced formation countering to that unbalanced side. And one of the things that we found from this, and we, we used to run this play from, from under center, is we would run our counter pass. And so this would normally be the tight end, and he would be going to this spot to get the ball, especially against teams that tight ends will, or excuse me, safeties will be feeling really hard off of motion. Okay. But in this case, we were running what we call our grab scheme, which is a post and a grab route here. And so when they come flying down to stop counter or power, if the safety is getting involved doing that, you're going to get a one on one here and you're going to have inside leverage if this safety doesn't hang back. And so we found that the protection was really good for the quarterback and it's easy to make a nice pocket. And so you, we kind of look one, to two here, and then you if you could add a third read, a, a dig on the backside or a backside post, you could add. We didn't, we were not able to get to that third read. But this is a, our first round of the playoffs, and right? So it's just, again, this is our counter H left play that we just showed you, but it's gonna be the pass off of it. So we ride it, this safety came running up, and he's, he's either taking this grab route or he was running up to fill and he's frozen now. Now we got one on one and we have our best receiver um, in that spot. What I really like about this play is it looks just like the run, right? We're going to be blocking down. We're going to be kicking out. We're going to be filling. It looks exactly like the run. We're not. We're not just, you know, pass setting like some teams do with, with a run action in the backfield. This, we make, we, it has to look the same, right? And this guy's flat footed now. We know we're going to get that one on one coverage. The next week, uh, we tried the same thing. And this time, our read isn't as good. We should have checked down. So you'll see them again, great protection. We didn't get this guy biting up as hard. There's too much of a cushion here. He should have taken the tight end on his route in this case, but he tried to force it um, in there. And so the corner actually makes a really good play. Luckily they did not pick that off, but, um, Good protection. We should be checking right here. Get a nice 10 yard pickup on the counter H grab. So as the, as the season went and we, we realized that our quarterback was, was mobile, we wanted to mix in our jet play, which is, is, is probably the main play that we hang our hat on our jet play with the counter because we, we were having success running counter but when we went to a spread set we wanted to still run jet and then we would run q counter so we started to run counter read so this is counter read left instead of blocking this guy we're going to read him right if he sits here at all or chases we're just giving the jet all these guys out here 
are all just blocking jet. They do that all the time. Everyone this way is blocking counter. So it's on the quarterback. It is a quick read, and it's kind of game plan quite a bit. You know, we, we kind of know for the most part what happens. You know, is the player going to be kind of squeezing or sitting, kind of doing that surfing technique? Is he going to just fire out when he sees motion his way? So it, it can be game plan, but we, we really try to work the read in practice so that they can make a proper read. Uh, our quarterback was pretty good. He was, I think he was guessing a bit at times, but even when he guessed, you know, when you get a guy going full speed, it's hard for this guy to catch him unless, um, unless he's running off the bat. And that should be easy for the quarterback to see. It, when in doubt, just give the jet because this running back can pick up any guy, you know, that's, that's coming on a, on a stunt or something or coming off a blitz off the edge. The running back can pick that guy up if he comes quickly. And that's his man that he'd be going for. We, we drive to the safety, the running back will get the next man. So here we are. Now this is that cheetah set, right? Two slots, two X's. We don't have any tight ends in the game. The H is out of the game. Okay, it's second and long, right? They might be expecting a pass, whatever. So we're gonna do looser formation here, counter, read left. So we send them in motion. And he's reading that guy. What's he doing? Well, this guy's chasing. He's chasing our pullers, right? And in this case, our tackle is pulling, like you mentioned. And so if he's going to do that, just give the ball. And now we're going to get to the next level here, right? We got it all blocked. They got, they have one man back here that's going to be unblocked if we can pick up the blocks. We get most of them and get a nice run out of it. Might be able to see the read a little bit better here. So this team does a nice job of like trying to squeeze as you down block, okay? Or he, he, in this case, he could be actually chasing. Looks like, yeah, he's on a stunt or he was chasing. So this is a very good read to give it. And we didn't even have to block a guy, right? If you have a tackle that, this tackle is actually really good, but if you have a guy that struggles on his reach blocks, yeah, this is this is a way to get get away with still running a jet play or a rocket or something like that without having to reach anybody. Um, you're just going to use the guy's technique against him, and if he was to sit there, right, if he's going to sit there like this guy is going to do, then we're going to keep it, right? This guy's going to he's going to sit and he's going to be waiting for your quarterback, or he's going to do the surfer technique and try to work his way out. Well, okay. We don't need to block you then. We're going to pull and kick out over here and pull and lead through. I think we might have a better view from the, ooh, that one didn't have an end zone copy. Uh, here, here it is again. Again, this, this is in our Bulldogs. We do have a tight end in the game, tight end, but we're still running counter read. We got motion. You can tell that time he didn't read the guy, but we knew that their their ends were playing real um, safe and kind of watching and, and checking kind of boot. Now in this case, he should go inside here, but he feels like he can just beat it to the outside and he does. he did go inside oh this one here is a great double team these guys did a tremendous job so they're doing counter he's got on to down he's got gap down backer tight end needs to wall this guy you can see the tackle came through and had to bump the defensive end out and we're still getting nine yards there this is the one here where he's going to bounce outside of the kickout block so this time the guy really squeezes down and we can't we can't get him out of the hole okay the second man through the tackle is coming through and he was going to help but we fall down the quarterback sees that 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 guy's there and you can see the guys chasing the jet right 
They're not, they're not reading our counter box. They're chasing Jet. Okay. So quarterback, if he can get around this, can have a big play. So this is, this is late in the season. This is, uh, when we start to use some of these weapons uh, to, to really uh, make it difficult for teams with some of our different personnel groups. So this is that cheetah group, no tight ends out there. That, that view's not very good, but here's another one. And, and this is something that these, the, the freshman comes into the game here and he does it on accident. He should be leading for the jet. Yeah. But he makes a mistake here. And this is something I've actually seen Ferris State use, and they run a lot of jet and jet read, counter read. They do a, a tremendous job with that. And they'll have they'll have the, the running back kind of check as the pullers go, check to see if this guy's chasing. And if, if he's not, he just leads the play. And so you get a third, a third man through. And this this guy does that unknowingly. I think. He may have thought that he was getting the counter because we did some jets where it would be a running back counter, but you can see how guard kicks out, tackle leads through, and then you would also have the running back leading through. So you'd have an extra man, which could be uh, very valuable if you got a good running back that can block. So we get through here and if he just goes right there or to safety, this probably goes into the end zone. Actually, it does get in there anyway, but it's quarterbacks just stiff arming people. Luckily, we got that kid coming <laughs> back. So, yeah, quarterback becomes a man child here. But you get the running back to block somebody, um, you can get away with um, having everybody blocked up. We'd, we'd have a man for everybody. So, that's, uh, yeah, that's a little wrinkle that was done by mistake, but a lot of teams that I've seen uh, do that will put the put that running back through. If you can see, you can get a third man through with your tackle, which could really help. Or if you had a, if you had an H back, yeah. maybe you could bring him up and through with the tackle. So I think that was it for um, for clips. But uh, yeah, those are some things that we did to to use different personnel groups. Like I said, initially it was to get some different kids on the field and then it, it had to rapidly change once those, some of those guys were gone. So how do you use those personnel groups? How do you use your base plays and change them when you need to uh, and have the, have the ability to do some, some different things from a standard play that maybe your kids learn in ninth grade and under center play like the counter. And how does that change and how can you add to it where you can, add that play action pass out of the gun at the, at the read that goes along with your jet. Um, a lot of teams will run even a triple option off of it too, where they're, they're either giving the, the, the counter or they're the quarterbacks out on the edge and he can throw a bubble or he can, and he can pitch off of that different things that you can do. So there, there's kind of endless possibilities, but it, it's what can your kids do? What can your, yeah. your coaches coach? And that's what I think um, this year was, was good for our coaching staff to, to go through and see what are we able to teach the kids? What do we have time to do? And, and where can we put them in groups to get, get that buy-in from the players? Now, when you're, you're um, as you're wrapping up this, well, your season's over now, but as you wrapped up things, what were you particularly looking at to evaluate? And, and how did you determine what do you was successful and what isn't? Um, so, so we did a breakdown of, so we kind of do our end of the season analysis and we'll do a breakdown of um, plays and yards and formations. And we even break, we start to break down the personnel groups, which personnel groups were having the most success. Right. And um, some of that has to be kind of looked at kind of just lightly because it's some of the personnel groups were used against certain teams and they might've had success against one team and not another, or it was a certain play. But I think you start to, to notice which, which personnel groups or which formations and plays stress certain teams the most if you look at each game individually. And that can start, that can help you kind of build your game plan for the following year. Like, hey, these things did really well against this team. 
we can use some of that. Or we really struggled trying to do these things against them. Let's not try that again. Yeah. What is, you know, what is the thing? Maybe we need to read their defensive end instead of uh, trying to kick him out or different things like that. So I think that helps. Um, and then looking at the personnel, what were our kids able to do from some of those different positions? And yes, this kid can do this, this. And so, so we're kind of really looking at it right now from a personnel level, going through each of the positions and, and kind of seeing, you know, can this kid run the jet? Yes. Can he, can he block? Well, no. Okay. And maybe he has to be a player that is out in space where he's more of a slot guy. He's not playing the wing as much. Can this guy, um, you know, can this guard pull and kick out? Yes. Okay. Can, um, can he pass that too? Okay. Maybe we need to, we need to move him to tackle, you know? So we, we kind of look at each kid of, of their skills and then, and then move through, uh, narrowing down our schemes, right? Okay. These are the schemes that we're going to start with. These are the personnel groups that we'll, we'll start with, which will probably be limited over what we did last year. I think we, we our biggest, fault was that we tried a little bit too much, but they, I think we were able to experiment a little bit more because of the, the constraints of the, the pandemic season and, and the okay. length of the season. We were able to try more. Now we're going to condense it and, and just try to improve at what we did. Now, in, in a normal season, what do you typically, is there any data points you typically track throughout the season or keep an eye out under a normal season? Um, I mean, one of the main ones that 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 we struggled with this year and last year was turnovers. You know, and, and we're, when when were these turnovers occurring? You know, are they are they in certain formations? Are they, are they turnovers that are based off of the snap? You know, like gun is a, a gun snap thing. Is it based off of a read play? Is it runners down the field? Right. So that's some of the things that we looked at. We had a lot of turnovers this year, and we had a lot of sacks. And is why are those things occurring? Is it based off of um, us doing plays that maybe the, the players aren't uh, getting enough practice time on or technique work? Or is it yeah. is it based off of them not knowing, like, for example, uh, is a sack occurring because um, your pass pro, they, they, they're not understanding what, what the pass pro is and they're making a mistake and then the quarterback gets hit. It's not really the quarterback's fault. It's based off of the, the offensive line. Or, you know, we're trying to figure out that's one of the main data points we look at trying to figure that out. And then I always go back and look at the explosive plays like, okay, in each game, where do these biggest plays occur? Um, what was the personnel group we used and the play? And you start to look at those and you, you got to start to think, Hey, we got to run this play more. Like there's a few plays that we do. Like, Hey, we ran that play four times during the season. Every time we ran it, it was 20 yards. Why aren't we running that a couple times a game? You know, um, and maybe it is so explosive because you're not doing it often, but then if it's, if it's something that could be worked in and it stresses the defense, why aren't we doing it more? And I think that's some of the stuff we look at turnovers, explosive plays. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at, uh, average yards, you know, for, you know, how consistent is this scheme, you know, so we will break down some of those specific plays and that, that helps a lot with the pass game too. You'll, you'll find out your quarterback is real comfortable in a, a couple pass concept and they're not in others so you'll see all the incomplete passes the picks and some of these concepts that we might be forcing on them that they're not um comfortable in throwing right and it's 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 strange sometimes we'll ask our quarterback hey it's third and eight games on the line what pass do you want to run and they'll say one that we would never even think of you know we're like okay you you'd want to run that why and so you're trying to dig deeper to see why they're doing that but it's usually based off of comfort you know, maybe that's a play that during the seven on sevens in the spring, they ran a ton. They feel so confident they can do it in their sleep, but we haven't been practicing it enough where we would call it in the game, but that's what, what they, what they like, you know, or what they feel that they have the ability to throw. So I think some of those things are, are good to look at in the off season as well. And then have that communication with your players to narrow things down uh, to be successful. Now, what do you define as, as an explosive play? Um, yeah, I guess different people will look at those numbers, uh, all over the board. I usually do it as, um, for, for me, I kind of look at, Hey, is the, is the play for, for runs usually 10 or more is kind of where I said, Hey, if it's 10 or more, we'll consider that explosive. And for, for passes, it's usually 15 to 20. It will be an explosive pass. So and I know some guys, 
will go, you know, with lower amounts for, for things, or they go for, for higher, where some people be, hey, it's got to be for runs 25 or more and things like that. But um, for our purposes, for, for high school football, that's what we're looking at. Okay. And then um, kind of, I mean, a, as you continue to evolve this, is there anything, I don't want more of this. How, how much are you still, I mean, obviously you've been condensing, but how much are you still evaluating that maybe add potential wrinkles still on top of what you have? Uh, yeah, we're, our coaches right now are meeting once a week, like a coaches meeting. So we're meeting and we're kind of um, drawing things on the board and kind of researching uh, each, each of the things that we do, you know, in the pass game and the run game and our formations. And so we're still narrowing that down. And um, usually by the end of March, we have that narrowed down and then we start to get into practice. And so then we'll start to narrow down um, in April, hopefully narrowing down how, we, how are we going to practice these schemes that we feel are, are going to benefit us and, and start to work then individually as coaches on the drills that you need yeah. to do and the, and the group work that we need to do to be successful. Because I think practice um, it really starts to trump the, the schemes. You can have all these great schemes, but if you can't get the group and individual work to get that to relate to the field, you're going to struggle. So that we're going to have a big focus on on practice time and individual and group time with, with the position coaches so that they, um, so they understand the scheme. Like I said, it's what your coaches know. Um, I can know the scheme, but it doesn't matter if, if another coach, you know, is off in his indie group and he's not teaching it right or, or they're struggling. He doesn't have the same um, conceptual knowledge of the scheme as I do. Cause then when you come together, then there's reteaching going on or the kids don't feel confident in it. So it's trying to get, co you know, coaches on the same, uh, page at this time of the year before we get to the summer workouts and, and start installing things uh, once you know once we get out of school yeah well coaches um, coaches contact information will be below um, as usual make sure you reach out to coach uh, like and subscribe uh, share this video so the coaches can see it so they can uh, get a chance to listen to coach here and so they can reach out to him maybe so they can change some ideas on some of the stuff he's doing some of the stuff y'all are doing um, it, allow, it allows everybody to kind of just continue to spread knowledge and continue everything. Um, as I said earlier in the podcast, make sure you check out the sponsors and affiliates below. If you're interested in any of their stuff, please click on there and go from and check on that. Um, and then also, again, if you want to listen to any particular part, um, questions or the film, the tags are below, uh, so you can check that out. Um, thank you. And that was another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast.